All right, uh, so my name is Michael Bredy, and today I'll be discussing uh, some of my work and developments in open source uh, electric propulsion for space. Uh, so mainly ion and plasma thrusters uh, for nanosatellites. Uh, so a little bit of a background. Um, I'm currently the founder of Applied Ion Systems. It started out kind of as a, as a hobby thing, sharing my, my work and research on Twitter and various social media and kind of grew um, based on the incredible support of the community. Um, as far as I'm aware, I'm the only independent maker-based um, person doing propulsion, uh, electric propulsion at home. Um, and really I'm looking at ultra low cost and easy to manufacture thrusters. So that way uh, more teams can access this uh, rather advanced and costly technology. And along the way, I also provide a lot of resources for the hobbyist, educational enthusiast communities and really engage people in the field and uh, bring more awareness and educational resources for these types of thruster systems. So starting off, why open source? Uh, I found in my um, experience that it opens up a lot of opportunities for collaboration. Um, I'm able to get things up to space and, and work with other teams for small satellites much faster than through conventional means. Um, it's a way to contribute to the community. Um, this type of research and development has never really been done before at this level. And there's been amazing community support. I really wouldn't be here now uh, if it wasn't for the incredible maker and, and open space and open source communities um, and, and members that have been you know, pushing me along. And really true accessibility to advanced technology only starts by removing conventional barriers to entry. Um, open source electric propulsion didn't exist really until until now, until I started um, pushing this more um, through the various channels that I interact with. So some major issues with current electric propulsion field. Uh, for one thing, EP is extremely expensive. We're talking about tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars a cost. And most nanosatellite teeps actually can't afford propulsion. It's just not possible. Uh, we're talking about extremely long development timeframes, usually around 10 to 15 years from initial concept to the first prototype testing in space. Um, very similar funding structures, you know, multi-million dollar uh, grants from big sources, single stream development. So usually these things are developed as a PhD spinoff, kind of as the one solution to the field. Um, so there's really focus on one particular uh, technology with millions being pumped into it. And at this point, there really isn't any financial incentive for anyone to develop propulsion for low funded entry level um, platforms. And really the mentality of the field makes it impossible actually to develop these technologies at an affordable cost. So some of my goals at Applied Ion Systems is uh, a greater than 10 times uh, cost reduction in EP technologies. Uh, reducing the barrier of entry for propulsion accessibility as well as propulsion R&D. Um, so you'll see kind of how I've simplified my approach and, and ultimately uh, can con hopefully convince you at the end of this that, that this stuff really isn't all that inaccessible. Um, I work at extremely rapid, pro pro rapid prototyping um, phases, so very, very fast compared to conventional means, and ultimately to really innovate not only designs but the approach to how this is done. So here's kind of my departure from, from the norm, my approach from academia to industry. Um, you can see immediately that, that the funding levels and the costs for between these two approaches is massively different. Um, my, my development times are on the order of less than six months and I'm looking to get stuff up in less than a year versus you know the 10 to 15 year average for prototyping. And a lot of that does come from a collaboration with the open source community. Um, so working with uh, also uh, do-it-yourself and surplus equipment and, and really catering to a large group of people out there working with nanolift satellites that can't actually afford to um, experiment with or use this type of technology. Um, so a little bit about my system going forward. Uh, this is the vacuum chamber setup that I use. This is based off of a uh, six inch conflat hardware, which is a kind of standard in vacuum industry. Um, so it's very, very compact. Normally when you see propulsion system testing, there are big chambers that you can almost walk into, um, but it's not really necessary for, you know, micro satellite type applications. So I went with bare bones, very basic setup, and there's a huge and growing community of do-it-yourself vacuum hackers all around the world doing everything from semiconductor to plasma physics and now with Maya for propulsion. So uh, this type of stuff is actually becoming significantly more accessible to the maker community. 
Um, in terms of design tools, I try to, I have to use free software. Uh, it's not always open source, but there's a lot of really powerful tools out there to help with design. Um, some really powerful software like Mofo Plus from uh, CERN or SRIM 2013 are actually uh, reference standards in, in research. Um, so they're very powerful programs that can actually aid in, in this type of work and reducing the cost um, for, for designs. So actually starting to get into some of the propulsion systems, this was the very first thruster that I ended up uh, building. This is the UPPT-1. It's a coaxial mic micropulse plasma thruster. Um, as you can see, it is very, very simple hardware. Um, we're talking stainless steel tubing, Teflon tubing, uh, hardware parts, and just a few PCB sockets that, that I, I had made from Oshpark. And um, the goal was to really make a system that was very uh, low cost and easy to assemble. This whole thing was built literally with a Dremel on uh, the dining room table, so very simple. I actually have the thruster here with me, so you can see uh, it's a very small system kind of for reference. And you can see the various little subsystems. So it's all press fit connections. Um, with this thruster, actually, the main part pops out from the PCB socket. So a lot of my approach is going for modularity and, and simplicity in design. Um, because I have to do everything myself, I have to make it so that always this stuff can be um, done on my own. Uh, this thruster actually never ended up firing. Uh, it, it didn't work, uh, but there was uh, this was kind of the gateway into talking with more people in the in the nanosat community, especially the pocket cube community, which has kind of pushed me into the new direction that I moved towards. Uh, moving forward, this is uh, another thruster that I worked on. Um, same type, it's a pulse plasma thruster, but very unusual topology. It's a flat stacked type system. So kind of for reference, um, this is the size of the thruster, about one inch uh, square with various channels drilled in it. So again, this was actually built right on the dining room table. I drilled everything out with a hand drill and cut with a uh, Dremel. So very, very simple uh, manufacturing. Uh, it's all bolted together with peak hardware and it's really something that could be built extraordinarily cheap. Um, so here we have a little bit of clip of it firing. This will be a very quick pulse because I only captured one pulse. Um, you can kind of see it fire. So that's that's actually kind of the, the pulse of the thing. And this is the captured image of the thruster actually firing in the high vacuum chamber. Uh, I only captured it once and in the process I destroyed a lot of equipment unfortunately trying to get this thing to fire. Um, but this was kind of the first stepping stone in saying like, hey, maybe this is actually doable at home and started getting people more interested. Uh, moving forward, we have the second generation of this. Uh, so going much smaller and more compact, the GPP-2 uh, pulse plasma thruster. So again, very, very simple construction. We're talking a few plates. Uh, there's an anode, uh, an igniter, and a cathode, as well as um, an insulator plate and Teflon fuel plate. Uh, this thruster is quite small. It's even smaller, about one centimeter for the uh, actual copper plate itself. So again, extremely simple, um, built with hand tools. This one was actually much more successful firing. So I have a little bit of a video of it firing here. Um, so you can see it operating in the high vacuum chamber uh, and firing. And this, this thruster actually lasted maybe about 500 shots. So enough shots for me to actually start capturing data on it. Uh, which was very exciting to start qualifying and characterizing the performance of this thruster. So this is a captured shot of the thruster. And one of the, I think, really cool things about this effort is, is actually just being able to see, um, you know, the, the beauty of the plasma and, and the physics behind these systems that can actually be uh, utilized in space. Um, so kind of part of, again, what I do is, is making stuff more accessible in terms of testing. So this is actually a test stand that I built. Um, it's a micro pendulum for measuring force. So very, very simple. I built it with all scraps and everything that was available to me, uh, a little Kapton flapper at the end. And by knowing the displacement and the various properties of the pendulum, you can actually determine the force generated uh, from the thruster and therefore know the thrust. So this was actually a very important step in showing that this stuff can be done very simply and, and cheaply, but also getting some actual quantitative data. And this type of pendulum system is in fact used in academia, just at a much larger scale. So being able to scale it down to a very small and compact system 
um, really opens up a lot of opportunities for, for much cheaper testing. Um, moving forward, we have the third generating generation of the thruster. Um, so this one uh, is a little bit more cleaned up and refined. It was the first time I actually had a thruster externally manufactured through a local machine shop. Uh, so some changes in the geometry. It has a permanent magnet embedded in the nozzle uh, to create a magnetic nozzle. And again, very simple basic structure, uh, more refined. Uh, the plastic pieces were actually machined by another maker, I believe out in California, who had been following my work and it opened up to me. And um, so this was a, one example of really awesome collaboration with others in the community that really helped bring down costs of this project. Uh, so this thruster was also the first to be integrated into an electronics module. Um, so the electronics here you, for, you see for the integrated module has everything needed to run on it. It has the high voltage supplies, it has ignition, it has the basic low voltage control circuitry. To give kind of a reference size, uh, this is kind of the size we're looking at. So extraordinarily compact and small, actually meant specifically for pocket cubes, which are a five centimeter uh, based standard satellite. So incredibly small and uh, there isn't any propulsion out there for these satellites, which is one thing that I really wanted to explore and, and contribute to the community is actually making modules that people can actually use at a very low cost. So again, a very, very small thruster, very low power, very simple. It only takes power, an enable signal, um, a trigger, and some, little, some voltage readouts. Um, so here we can actually see the thruster firing in vacuum. Uh, so this test was very successful. Um, and actually led to some further collaborations down the road. But this also showed that, you know, a full going from just a theoretical, you know, a few stacked plates to a full system uh, could in fact be engineered and done uh, at home with very, very limited resources and um, showed that full integrated systems can be developed and innovated uh, with, with, again, very, very limited resources that I have as a maker at home. Um, so the captured plume, if you actually visit my social media stuff, you'll see this kind of picture plastered everywhere. Uh, cause it's, I think it's a, it's a very, very cool picture to see the, the plasma and, and how it evolves as the plume. Um, so going forward, this has led to a bunch of collaborations with groups from all around the world, uh, in, in helping me, uh, bring more advances to open source electric propulsion while providing resources to the community to advance this. Um, so one of the ongoing collaborations is with AMSAT Spain, also with FASA Systems and the Libra Space Foundation on the uh, Genesis satellites. So I built two of the uh, GPPT-3 pulse plasma thrusters and sent that over to them for integration. Uh, their Genesis pocket cubes are um, 1.5 P pocket cube, so um, about seven and a half centimeters long. And uh, we'll be using this as a demonstration payload uh, in orbit. So you can see here um, the thruster actually being integrated in Spain. So it's actually been successfully integrated as well as uh, the basic controls established and has passed vibration testing. So there are some pretty big milestones for this project. And uh, if this works, this would be the first time that this type of thrust, this type, this class of satellite has ever fired propulsion in orbit, uh, which is a major win for the pocket cube community. It's a really groundbreaking win for for the propulsion field in general, and also for the maker community, and and the open source and open space community. You know, it shows that such an advanced system such as propulsion can be done very cheap, uh, very simply, and really, you know something built on, on a dining room table, um, actually launched and firing in space is, is uh, quite an impressive accomplishment, especially with all of the collaboration from multiple open communities around the world to get this project going. So going forward, I continuously evolve and develop my systems further. Uh, so this is one of the new generations of pulse plasma thrusters I'm working on, the EPPT series. So it takes, um, a lot of lessons learned from my prior uh, builds and expands upon them. So reducing the cost, making it more uh, affordable, making it easier. So the body is 3D printed. Uh, so I eliminate any custom machining, making it simpler and, and cheaper to make. Uh, so this will actually be 
built and tested probably within the next coming months. Um, the most exciting development so far, uh, I would say, is the uh, Illus One that I am working on. This is an ionic liquid electrospray thruster. Uh, so unlike the other thrusters, which were plasma thrusters, um, this thruster is an ion thruster, so a bit different physics, but um, very exciting. And then that this technology is very hyped right now in the propulsion field. Millions of dollars are being pumped into it. And uh, to be able to show that it can be done very cheap on a budget, essentially of a maker budget, uh, would be quite uh, paradigm shifting in the field and, and possibly surprise a lot of people that this type of advanced thruster can be done at this level. Um, so this thruster actually uses um, ionic liquid molten salts, or room temperature molten salts, so I can extract both positive and negative ions uh, from the emitter for charge neutralization. And um, there's a lot of, uh, there's a, like I said, a lot of work being done on this thruster and to be able to bring it down to this level of satellite for scaling um, and for cost and for accessibility really opens up the field to, to even more advanced systems at this level. Uh, so this is kind of the current development of the system now. I do have the PCBs uh, from Osh Park, which came out amazing. Um, so there are a few components currently in production. The ion emitter is being manufactured now. Um, and currently I am undergoing testing. Um, so this is the module with a high voltage test load I built that interfaces where the emitter will be going. Um, so lots of exciting things moving forward. Uh, this testing will be done uh, in a few months as well. And all of my testing and everything, um, I usually do live testing, live either live tweets or actually live uh, propulsion um, testing on YouTube. So live streaming these things to allow the community to access this stuff um, and really engage the community more. Um, even when things go horribly wrong, um, troubleshooting the propulsion system real time and talking with people really helps uh, allow um, enthusiasts to actually engage in, in actual propulsion testing and see what goes on behind the scenes. Um, so if you'd like, you can actually follow all of my uh, efforts on various social media. I post constantly. I post all of my resources or everything from uh, research to documentation, um, videos, build pictures. You can find really everything on these ongoing developments across the board. And I have to really shout out to all my followers who have been um, helping and pushing me. I wouldn't be have gone this far without the amazing support of the community so far. Um, and if you would like to contribute, I do have a few. Uh, hey, Michael, funny... we're, we're wrapping up. You're hitting oh, time. Sorry. Yep, uh, almost done. Uh, so I do have a few. You, my friend, are done. Oh. <laughs> well, <laughs> but we can move into the in Discord channel. If you have one more slide you want to hit, that's fine. Oh, yeah, this is the last slide. Uh, so th thanks again, everyone, for, for, um, for listening to this talk. And uh, again, I'm open on the Discord channel for further talks. So thank you very much. Thank you so much.